Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's good. Y'all can be seated as you're seated. Give somebody a handshake next to you and say, welcome to church. Thank you so much, team. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Devon. Thank you, guys. Great job. All right, all right. Mm. The house of God. It's a good place to be today. Is there anybody who knows that stuff happens in the house, right? You know, this is where stuff happens. So we're about to have some stuff happen today. I don't know why you came to church, but some stuff's about to happen. So uh, James 5, 13 through 15, this is our last sermon from the Growth Challenge that's going to be on a service. And uh, it will also be the, well, I think it's tomorrow. If I'm Christian, is it tomorrow when they get to break from the water? Tomorrow's the last day. So it's Tuesday they get to break from the water. Tuesday, okay. How many of y'all are excited to drink something else? Y'all are just in the flesh, just the flesh, the flesh. Man, uh, the water's good, but this is some gross water. Can I just never recommend Arrowhead water? Gross. Why do we have these at the church? Dear God, okay. We just, we got to repent right now. All right. James 5, 13 through 15. Dear God. Get some Fiji up in here. Where's the Fiji water at? Come on now. <laughs> there is a difference in water. Does anybody agree with this? Some water is better than others. Okay, okay. Some of y'all are like, man, I've been on tap my whole life. I don't know what you're talking about. You have not experienced the other levels of glory. Let's just say that. Okay. James 5, 13 through 15. Is anyone among you suffering? He must pray. Is anyone joyful? He is to sing praises to God. Is anyone among you sick? He must call for the elders, the spiritual leaders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of Jesus. And the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he was committed any sins, he will also be forgiven. There's many things that we could talk about in this scripture, but I want to talk about one phrase, the prayer of faith. I want to talk to you about what it means to pray and get results. There is a type of prayer that Christians make every day that is shifting what is going on in our nation. There is a type of prayer that some believers are praying that when they pray it, sick bodies get healed. There is a type of prayer that some believers, not all believers are praying, that when they pray it, other people when they pray for them get the breakthrough that they're praying for. There is a type of prayer that when you pray it, your son and daughter returns to the house of God because you know how to pray the right way. There is a type of prayer that believers pray that when they pray it, results happen. The Bible says the prayer, the prayer of faith of the righteous man or woman avails much, meaning that it gets the job done. There are people who are believers who pray, and when they pray, whatever they prayed for gets done. Can I say that again? There are believers who when they pray, whatever they pray for gets done, but it is not all believers. There are many believers who pray, and they never receive what they pray for because they don't know how to pray the prayer of faith. There is a prayer called the prayer of faith that shifts weather patterns. It turns off storms. It tells tornadoes to go the other direction. It shifts what happens in nations. It takes politicians out of office, and it puts them in office. It shifts leadership. There is a people that when they pray, and they pray the prayer of faith, they can bow themselves down, humble themselves, call upon their God, and He will heal their land. But it is from people who know how to pray the right way. Not every believer 
Millions of believers, I would say, even in America, are praying and not receiving what they pray for, so they don't pray anymore. Because it's not fun to pray and not receive what you're asking for. But it is a blast. It is the greatest fun in the world to pray and receive. To pray and receive. To pray and receive. It's fun. It's addicting to pray that way. It's addicting to pray and lay hands and somebody gets healed. It's addicting to pray and get a breakthrough for somebody. It's addicting to say, I'm done with this. I've had this temptation over and over and over, but the cycle is ending today. And to actually mean it, and it actually changes, it's addicting. But it is the prayer of faith that God is looking for. He's not looking for the prayer of unbelief. He's not looking for the prayer of doubts. He's not looking for the prayer of questions. He's not looking for the prayer of arguments. He's looking for a prayer of faith. God searches the whole earth, the Bible says, looking to show himself strong on behalf of a heart that's fully devoted to him. We're in church and we're arguing about the color of the carpet. We're in church and we're arguing about who has the most people. We're in church down here arguing about the lights are too high. We're arguing about the kind of music we pray. But God is looking in heaven for a heart that's fully devoted to him. We can waste our time. Churches won't even get together. They won't even cross the parking lot and join each other for a lunch. Pastors won't talk to each other. They're in competition with each other. You see, the devil doesn't even need to fight against the church because in many instances we fight against ourselves. So we're in this place but God is looking for, you see, in the midst of pandemics, God is not worried about the pandemics. Matter of fact, he wasn't even alerted. He's not in a state of emergency. He's not surprised by what's going on. He's simply looking for a heart that's fully devoted to him. And don't you know that Jesus took the Israelites through the desert 40 years? Their clothes never wore out. Their feet never, their shoes never. They were clean shoes the whole time. They never got sick. All their animals, everything was good. Why? Because when you have a heart fully devoted, God takes care of you in the midst of famines. He takes care of you in the midst of pandemics. He takes care of you. I don't care if the gas prices go to $13 a gallon. It doesn't matter because you're not subject to the economy of this world anyway. You're subject to God. But it's going to all be done through faith. Hebrews eleven six. 6, watch this. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists, and listen to this, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, God's a rewarder? Say it to him. Turn it to the next neighbor. God's a rewarder. Here's the deal. Many people approach God, and they're sacrificing, they're suffering, they're doing these things, and they're like, they expect nothing because they don't feel they deserve anything. And I get you 100%. Obviously, our sin has disqualified us all, but you don't understand the nature of our God. Our God loves to reward you. The Bible says Peter came to Jesus and he said, Lord, we've left everything for you. We've left houses. We've left homes. We've left friends. Has anybody in here ever left friends for Jesus because they weren't good for you anymore? Look at this. Has anybody in here ever moved because God told you literally to move your house? You moved. Look at that. You literally move where you are. Has anybody here ever quit a job because God said you're not supposed to be there? Look at all this. Has anybody here ever broke up in a relationship because God said it's toxic for you? Look at this. He says to Peter, he says, I'm glad you asked this because you got to know I'm a rewarder. He says, no one will leave a home no one will leave a person or a friend that will not receive in this life 100-fold back from what they are given. Not in heaven, but in this life. God is going to reward you now. God is into rewarding you now. He's into giving you blessing now. But you have to believe. This is a qualification of God. He says if you want to pray, you have to come praying and believing God's going to reward you. Some of y'all don't even pray believing that God's even there listening. The Bible says this. It says, draw near to God, James 4, and he will draw near to you. I'm going to say it again, really simple. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. You take the first step, 
God takes a mile. You take an inch, God takes a mile. You take a step, God draws near to you. Now, please understand, he's not suggesting this. He's saying, if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. So this is the problem. You come to God, but you don't expect that he's coming to you. Here's the deal. When you stop hoping that God will show up to your prayer time, and you go into prayer knowing God is showing up, it will change your prayer life. You hear what I just said? Some of y'all get into God's presence, and you pray hoping he's listening, hoping he hears you, and hopefully maybe you'll get a touch. But then there are those of us who read the Word of God and know that it's not a suggestion. If I draw near, He is here right now. He's coming among me. I expect He's listening. It will change your prayer life. It's not a question of if. It's a question of do you believe the Word? Because if He said it, I expect it's going to happen. So let's talk about faith. Jesus, when He's reading, and you've got to understand the prayer of faith, because tonight, this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the prayer of faith for a few minutes, and then every person who is sick in this building, we're going to get the leaders, just like this thing says. We're going to get oil on our hands. You're going to walk by and get touched today, and God is going to heal many of you in this place right now in just a moment, okay? So here's what's going to happen. Jesus, when he healed people, he did it one of three faiths. The first kind of faith that Jesus used was his own faith. There's an example where the Bible says that Jesus is walking through a town, and there is a boy who's in a casket. He's dead. They have a funeral procession, and the Bible says Jesus comes over, taps on the casket, the boy gets up from the dead, walks over, hugs his family, and they go out for lunch. The boy's dead, so can I ask you something? Can the dead boy have faith? So it wasn't his faith that did that miracle, it was Jesus' faith. He couldn't have any faith for himself, he's dead. So in this case today, it's my faith, it's the faith of the elders today, it's the faith of the leaders that are going to come up in here. We're going to have faith for you. I want to guarantee you this, we will not be in unbelief for you today. We're going to stand there in faith, okay? So that's number one. The second kind of faith, Jesus looks at many, this is about 75% of the miracles in the Bible, and he says, your faith has made you whole. Your faith. So sometimes it was Jesus' faith, but on the most occasions, it was their faith. Think about the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus didn't even see her. He's just walking. But her faith was so strong, she said, if I could just touch, if I could just get in there, if I could just, I don't care who's going to look at me. I don't care how embarrassing it looks. I don't care if everybody thinks, because understand, she had a blood, she had a blood disease of 12 years. The people who have, in the Old Testament, and the New Testament, people who had diseases were considered the same as lepers. So they were untouchable. So what would happen is this woman would walk through and people would go, unclean, unclean, unclean. You'd have to shout, unclean. So she's literally sitting there with over a thousand people that are surrounding Jesus trying to rub up against him. Listen, they're all touching him, but none of them are getting anything from him because there is one believer that approaches him and touches him because they want to be around him. But then there's a believer who touches him in faith. And because they touch him in faith, they pull out of him what he has. There's two kinds of believers in church. There's believers who pray, and then there's believers who pray the prayer of faith. So this touch was different. Jesus said, who touched me? And all the disciples said, what are you talking about? Everybody's touching you. He goes, no, no, no. Only one woman actually touched me. Everyone is touching me, but only one woman touched me. Faith. Faith. I can't just work with tears, even though I care about them. i got to see some faith. I can't just work with complaining. I can't work with doubts. I can't work with unbelief. Somebody's got to have some faith that rises up. So there's faith that he had or that we're going to have. There's faith that you have. And the third kind of faith is someone else's faith. This is a beautiful story. It said that there's a lame man. Jesus is speaking in a house. It's so packed nobody can get in. So it says his friends, there's four friends that are around this layman, and they're bringing him to Jesus to get healed because they love this man. He's their friend. They love this man. This man did not have faith for himself. They had faith for this man. So it says, we're not going to let this stop us. So they go on top of the roof, and it says they tear open the roof, and they throw him on Jesus. <laughs> That's the kind of friend you need. You need to stop having friends that are taking you away from Jesus, and you need to have friends that are pulling you towards Jesus. They're the ones going to throw you on Jesus. You see, listen, let me give you an advice about friendship. They are not your friend if they're continually reminding you about your past and mistakes. 
They are your friend if they're continually reminding you about your potential and your purpose in God. They are not your friend if they are consistently trying to pry you and tempt you to come away from the things of God. They are your friends if they're constantly throwing you on Jesus. So it says they open it up, they throw him down, and this is what Jesus said. He looks at the man, and he said he looks up at the friends on the roof, and he says, your faith has healed this man. You see, some of y'all didn't even have faith for yourself, but your mama had faith for you. Some of y'all didn't even have faith for yourself, but your grandmother was praying for you. Some of y'all wouldn't have been here in this building if it hadn't been for your brother or your sister or your aunt or your uncle or your grandmama or your great-grandmama. They kept dragging you into the house. They kept putting you in front of God. How many of y'all are grateful for people who didn't give up on you and they had faith? But understand, in every single situation, it's one of three faiths. Somebody's got to have faith. It's either going to be us, it's going to be you, or it's going to be somebody. But God cannot work without God cannot work without Okay, so now that we understand that, let's talk about what faith is. Faith is, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Here we go. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Please understand, a substance... This paper is substance. That's why I can hold it. I can hit it. It's a substance. This stage, a substance. That's why I'm able to stand on it. If it wasn't a substance, I'd fall down. This is a substance. Now, substance means it's something tangible. So when we have faith, many believers are like, I have faith, but what is faith? You know, I can't see it. I can't feel it. Oh, you're wrong. In the spirit, faith is a tangible commodity. It's something, it's like money. It's how you buy things in the spirit. It's literally how you do it. Faith is the way that you get things in the spirit. So it's literally a thing. And some people have more faith than other people have. How can you grow your faith? The Bible says you can grow your faith. How could you grow it if it wasn't a substance? You can only grow something in quantities if it's measurable. So it's a substance. Here's the other thing. It's an evidence. You see, when you go to court, you go to court, and if you say your case, the uh, judge is going to ask for what? Where's the evidence? If you have no evidence, what's going to happen to your court case? You're losing every time. It's getting dismissed. You presented no evidence for the argument that you had. But what the Bible is saying is because you have faith, you have all the evidence you need. Understand, when you have faith, you have the evidence. And if you have the evidence, the case is in your favor every time. If you you have faith... You have evidence, and when you present evidence, you win the court case. What's the case? The case for your children. If you have faith, you have evidence. The case for your healed body. If you have faith, you have evidence. The case for the breakthrough you need. If you have faith, you have evidence. But there's only one kind of faith that produces results. It is the faith that God talks about in his word. And if you don't know what this faith is, you're not getting results. So here we go. Faith is two parts. Hebrews 11.1, 1. now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's a substance and an evidence. This is what it also means. This is so good. When you break down every single one of these words, the Greek, the Aramaic, the Hebrew, all that fancy stuff. When you break it down, you come to this conclusion. Faith is acting like you already have what you're hoping for. I'm going to say it again. Faith is acting like you already have what you just spoke. So if I get prayer for healing, I'm going to act healed. If I get prayer to break my depression, I'm going to stop acting depressed. If I get prayer to break my loneliness, I'm going to realize I'm not alone anyway because God's inside of me. If I get prayer... You see, believers, we don't... There's so many people in the church, they're never receiving anything because they, they say they have faith, but they're not accessing a faith God can use. Faith is acting like. Here's the deal. If you're going to pray it and say it, why aren't you acting like you have it? Because I got to wait till I feel I have it. Are you kidding me? What if, how many things can you actually wait till you feel like and get from God? What, oh, I'm going to wait till I feel joyful to finally show joy. I'm going to wait till every friend in the world comes to me so I can finally have friends. No, the Bible says if you want friends, show yourself friendly. You want friends, but you're sitting in your house and you're not getting out among any people. But you want friends. 
Show yourself friendly. Get out there. If you want to be healed, you said you're healed, but you're not acting like it. You're still complaining about it. You're still talking about your sickness. You're praising your sickness. You're testifying about your sickness. <laughs> so faith is two parts. Here we go. Number one, the speaking part of faith. Only complete faith. There's an incomplete faith, and then there's a complete faith. Incomplete faith does nothing with God. But the Bible talks about a complete faith. Complete faith is two parts. Number one is speaking. You have to speak. You have to say it. You have to actually, the Bible says, Isaiah 55, his words will not return to him void, but they will accomplish what it was sent to do. What is he saying? The moment you read it on the Bible, the moment you read the scripture or the promise for whatever area of your life, you read it, that's God saying yes. The promises of God, 1 Corinthians, in Jesus are yes and amen. Can we say that again? They're yes and amen. Say it again. They're yes and amen. The yes is the moment that you read it. The yes is the moment you read it because God said yes. That's why it's on the page. You wouldn't read it if it wasn't a yes from God. So yes is the moment you read it. The amen is when you're walking in the fullness of it. So there's yes and amen. Some of y'all are in the and season between the yes and amen. But it totally determines if you know and trust God and have faith in the and season for if you're going to see the amen moment. Let me, let me give you a great example. Jesus is at the wedding feast, okay? And it said they were out of wine. So he goes over here and look what he does. It says he takes the servants... After his mom made him do this, he didn't even want to do it, but his mom, you know, mom said, so I guess I got to, anyway, moms. Ugh. So he goes over there, and he said he pulls out water, and he puts water into the cups, and then he tells them, take that water over to the king. They don't need water. They need wine. Watch this. They don't need water. They need wine, but he gives them water because that's his Yes. They walk in faith, believing that by the time they get to the king, this water is going to turn into wine. This is how faith works. God says it. He gives you something. And then you walk with it in faith, believing that the moment you need it, it will be there. <laughs> Woo! You, you, this is how you receive. So he gives them water, and somewhere between the walk from Jesus to when they got there, it turned into the best-tasting wine the groomsmen had ever had. The question is, are you going to walk with it, or are you going to complain that it's water? Are you going to walk in the miracle, or are you going to complain that it's water? Are you going to play, well, I don't feel healed. Well, I don't feel happy yet. Happiness is overrated. Happiness is overrated. You didn't get saved to be happy. Happiness is a state that depends on your circumstances. Joy is a supernatural thing that comes from the Holy Spirit that's deep down inside of you that has nothing to do with your circumstances. The Bible says God told of Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The cross was not fun. The cross was not happiness, but he did it in joy. Why? Because joy is all about purpose. Joy is all about God getting something out of this. Joy is about I'm waking up with something that means significance in my life. Joy is something you can have. It doesn't matter if there's a pandemic. It doesn't matter if people are gossiping about you. I still have joy everywhere I go because I have a deep, listen, I have a deep-seated trust in God who's bigger than everything that's happening to me. That's joy, okay? So here's the thing. You take your water but you know it's actually wine. It's just not wine yet. What, what made the water into wine? <sighs> Movement. Listen to what I'm saying. The water was turned into wine from movement. Steps not taken in doubt, but steps taken in faith. So the moment that it happened, they knew that they had what they needed. It didn't look like what they needed yet, but the moment they received from Jesus, and I'm going to get to this in just a second, is the moment they knew they received what they needed. And they walked in faith. The steps of faith created from water into wine on the spot. 
So here's the deal. Many of you are about to get prayed for today. Some of you are going to get literally healed automatically. Like right now, the pain's going to be gone. This last service, we had a man who was just sitting here right on the front row, and he's had degenerative disc disease for the last 12 years. We prayed. The prayer was two minutes long. The service was ending. We were out of time. So we just prayed where people were at. And he started jumping up and down, and he had no pain after 12 years of degenerative disc disease. It just happened in the 9 a.m. service. Okay, that's because he believed the moment he prayed was the moment he received. Let me get to that. Okay, um, uh, th th this is uh, Mark eleven twenty three through 24. I assure you and most solemnly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, does not doubt God's unlimited power. Pause. When you doubt, you're not doubting you, you're doubting God's power. You're doubting God's ability because you couldn't heal yourself anyway. So the only thing left to doubt is God. Now, if I asked every single one of you today, is God able? What would you say? Let me ask again. Is God able? Okay, so every single one of you say God is able. But, but here's the deal. You all say that, but then when we get to actually believing it, you doubt he's able. Yeah, God's able. He can do anything he wants. I think everybody would agree on that. But the moment you actually put it to the test, uh, I don't know. Because you're not doubting you, you're doubting God's ability. So watch this. It says, now whatever, God's unlimited power, but believes that what he says is going to take place, it will be done to him in accordance with God's will. This is important. We'll get back to it in a second. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever things you ask for in prayer, in accordance with God's will, there it is again, believe with confident trust that you have received them and they will be given to you. When is the moment that you receive? The moment you ask. The moment of receiving is the moment of asking. This is what believers miss. They wait till they feel it to say they received it. But faith works this way. The moment you believe it and say it is the moment that you received it. Now you're outworking what you received. So here's the deal. You will not pray something and you will not have confidence in praying it if you're not sure of one thing. And that's 1 John chapter 5, 14 through 15. It says you have to pray these things in accordance with God's will. Look at what 1 John 5. It said this is the remarkable degree of confidence we have as believers that we have before him. That if we ask anything, look, according to his will, that is consistent with his plan and purpose, he hears us. Next verse. And if we know for a fact that he hears us and listens to whatever we ask, we know with a settled knowledge that we have what we asked. So here's the deal. Anything you agree with that is God's will, you will have. But remember, first verse said, this is the confidence we have in prayer. Believers do not have confidence in prayer because they're not sure what they're asking is God's will. You're not even sure God's hearing you because you're not sure what you're asking is God's will. And I have to say this, that is laziness that is not God's fault. What do I mean by laziness? Well, God's will is written in the Word. If you would just get into the Word, you'd find out what God's will is in every situation. You'd know exactly what to pray. You'd know exactly what to do. But here's our issue. The church is in a word famine. We are operating our churches, and there are pastors who are literally pastoring churches who have not even read the whole Bible. There are books of the Bible they've literally never even read, and they're pastors. But it's the whole counsel of God. It's Genesis to Revelation is all the whole counsel of God. You can't leave out that. You can't leave out that. There are churches who will literally, I've been to churches who told me I could not say the blood of Jesus. There are churches who say, when you pray, I only want you to pray for them in their seats, but they cannot come up for altar calls because they'll want me to do that, and I don't do altar calls. Pastors. Y'all, 
If we're in a word famine, how can you expect to pass the test and the quizzes of life without the life book? How can you expect to pass the test you're going to need as a mother unless you know how to be a mother from the life book? How are you going to expect to pass the test as a father unless God shows you how to be a dad from the life book? How are you going to be a friend if you don't know how to be a friend from the life book? How are you going to survive in your marriage if you don't look into the marriage book, the greatest one of all time? I'm not against other books, but let me tell you something. If you're looking for other books before you look at the book, we have conferences. We literally do conferences in churches based on other people's marriage books. What about the book? Can we do a conference based on marriage from the Bible? So if you want to have confidence that what you're praying is going to come to pass, you need to know that you're praying God's will. You will always know you're praying God's will if you just repeat the words he's already written down. Just say them back to him. Isaiah 55, his word will not return to him void, but accomplish. What does that mean? God says it, but the power to change something is when it is returned. Did you catch what I just said? The <laughs> The power that changes nothing into something is when his words become your words and they're returned back to heaven. It won't return. It's in the returning back that something begins to manifest on earth that is already in heaven. Why did Jesus have to tell people to pray that? If it was God's will, why didn't he just manifest heaven on earth? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why is he saying this? Because the disciples said, teach us how to pray. So in other words, you have to say that. Even though God wants his will done on earth, unless you say thy will be done on earth, you're not in agreement. Therefore, he's not authorized to move in your situation. He doesn't butt into your business. God will not take over the things that you do not invite him into. So he waits for you to say it. He waits for you to believe it. He waits for you to send it back and say, Lord, this is your space. This isn't my life. This is you. Your kingdom come on earth in my family, in my marriage, in my body. <laughs> Number two part of faith is acting. So there's the speaking, and then there's the acting. This is James 2, 19 through 22. Go ahead and play that track. Devon, who's not there, play that track. <sighs> James 2, 19 through 22. Maybe he's coming up. You say you have faith, okay? For you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this. <laughs> and they tremble in terror. Pause. Demons have more faith than most Christians. Do you remember when Jesus was going through? Do you remember all the people doubted him? But there wasn't one time that the demon didn't know who he was. <laughs> they were clear. You are the son of the living God. Why have you come before the time? You are the... They never doubted who he was. Matter of fact, the devil believes in the Bible more than most Christians. Because he actually used the word against Jesus himself. <laughs> we won't talk about that right now. The devil knows the power of the word. But when it gets into your mouth with faith, it causes him to flee. It causes him to flee. Okay. You have faith. Good for you. Even the demons do this. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. There's incomplete faith. God can't work with it. And there's complete faith. The complete faith is a faith that says it and believes that the moment you said it was the moment you received it. And then there's a faith that says it, and then they act like they have what they said. Who are you? What kind of a believer are you? Because I could be honest with you, you could come to church for the next 30 or 40 years 
and show up to the building because you want to make sure you go to heaven, but you could be missing all of heaven wants to give you here on earth because you never access it in faith. This life can be the most exciting life you've ever had. This Christian life, this as a believer, will be the most exciting. <laughs> you won't be able to know what to expect, but it's exciting. God is in charge, and that gives you trust. But magnificent, miraculous, powerful things come through you, mama. They come through you, dad. They'll come through you, married couple. They'll come through you, young man, young woman. Miraculous. The Bible says that the sons of God will do mighty exploits. But those are not sons and daughters who are worrying and arguing with each other and debating about meaningless things. They're people whose hearts are fully devoted. Because you said it, I believe it. And I believe the moment I said it is the moment I received it. And now I walk like I have it. I walk like I have it. If the leaders could come up, please, real quick. We're going to take some oil. The leaders have asked to come up here. There's certain leaders. You know who you are. Please come up. If you go ahead and put that oil in everybody's hands. I want husbands and wives to please stand opposite of each other. And they're going to make a little tunnel up here. They're getting oil on their hands right now. Husbands, wives, please stand opposite of each other. Make a space in the middle because they're going to walk through. Thank you. Look at this. We got some elders right here, elders in the Holy Ghost. Bible says get the church leaders and the elders. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. You guys are going to stand here. I'm going to read these couple examples that go of how Jesus heals. And then what's going to happen is you're all going to be right here in this tunnel. Stay close together. I'm going to ask everybody right now, everybody who is, has any sickness or illness right now or pain, I want you to just stand where you're at right now. If you say, that's me, I want the prayer of faith. Stand up just right where you're at. Thank you. Thank you, every person. Now, I've done this all over the world. I promise this will go great. What we're going to do is very simple. Please pay attention. This is how it's going to work. I want you to watch me and do exactly what I do. We're going to start section by section. Power is about to touch people's lives. We're going to start with this section, then we're going to go to this section, and so on and so forth. But this section will come up, and this is what you're going to do. You're going to walk, and you're not going to stop walking. Touch me on the head. Touch me on the head. You're going to continue to walk all the way around here, and you're going to walk all the way around the back right here, right through the front, all the way around the back of the church, right back to your seat and stand there. There is no stopping. You're not going to stop and Miss Janet's not going to get your head and be like, ah, it's not about to happen. <laughs> Chris is not going to be like, sack, 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 sack. none of that's happening. You're going to continue to walk. Don't stop. Continue to move right through, go all the way back. We're just touching. This is the key. When faith touches faith, a miracle is birthed. When faith touches faith, a miracle is birthed. So they have oil on their hands. This is what I want you to do. Every person who's standing, I want you to lift your hands right now. Here we go. There are 10 ways that Jesus will fulfill this healing. Are you ready? I'm going to say them real fast. Number one, this is what's going to happen to some of you. Automatically, you're about to be healed. Just automatically. That's the leper. He comes to Jesus. Can I be healed? He said, you are healed. He's healed on the spot. I was just in Minnesota two weeks ago. And I was praying. And there was a healing line. Two weeks ago, I'm at this church. And I'm praying over this guy who has growth underneath his skin and his arms. Growths. I'm praying and rubbing the skin. And they're going away under my hand as we're praying. Totally healed of the skin condition. But there was a woman who was two people over. Nobody was laying hands on her. She was just in an atmosphere of faith. And what happened was she didn't wait for me because I couldn't give her the healing anyway. She went to the healer and she stood there. Her leg was broken. She had a fractured tibia all the way down her bone just standing there. And she was like this. And while I'm standing there and while she's standing there exceeding from God, I walk over to her. I said, what happened? She said, my bone just snapped into place. I said, what are you talking, when? She says, when you were praying over there, my bone snapped into place over here. In the moment she believed, Automatically. Number two, 
God heals gradually. It's in percentages. Jesus laid hands on the blind man, spit in his eyes. He said, can you see? He says, I can see a little bit better, but Jesus lays hands again. So some of y'all are going to get hands laid on you. You're going to feel some pain go away, but you'll go home and it's not all done. You'll wake up tomorrow and it will be gone. So that's gradually. Number three is it said <coughs> he heals also by as you go, 10 lepers. So the 10 lepers come to Jesus. He says, be healed. Go share yourself to the priest. And they didn't get touched. They didn't get healed. But as they went and walked, we don't know if it's five hours later. We don't know if it's 20 hours later. We don't know if it was two days. They went and they were healed as they walked. Some of you are going to get touched, not feel a thing. But because you believed you received the moment you were touched, you're going to go home and over the next week, you're going to be doing this and your back pain is going to be gradually going away. You're going to be sitting on your swelling will end. Some of y'all are going to have the best sleep you've ever had in your life because the anxiety attacks are going to be gone. There was a man, he was in Texas. I was there, I prayed over him. He had an oxygen tank. He was sitting there in a seat, had a whole mask over his face. He didn't feel anything when I prayed for him, and I didn't feel anything either. So we're sitting there, and he goes home, and God asks him, he says, do you believe you received the moment you prayed? The man was sitting on his couch. He goes, I do. And then God says, so do you believe it? Then act like it. He takes his mask off. He goes and he walks a mile. Walks a mile outside. Completely healed. And he was not able to breathe. His lungs opened up. Completely healed. Some of y'all, as you go, you're going to be healed. Number four, after obeying something God tells you to do. If you have any unforgiveness, I'm telling you, this is the time. Because I cannot tell you how many people the restraining of healing happens because you will not forgive. God has told some of you to call family members and apologize. God has told some of y'all to do something. And I'm telling you, it is restrained many times until we simply obey what God wants us to do. Do not let your pride. Naaman was a leper. He comes and the man of God didn't come out. But he says, go dip into the river seven times. Naaman was embarrassed. He's like, doesn't he know who I am? His pride almost cost him his miracle. Do not let pride cost you your miracle. Be willing to look foolish for Jesus, and he will make the world notice what's going on in your life. Number five, <coughs> after demonic deliverance. Some of y'all, for instance, arthritis. If you have arthritis, wave your hand. Arthritis, epilepsies. Does anybody ever hear of epilepsies or seizures? Okay. Those, almost 99.9% .9 of the time, just a couple examples, there are some diseases that are demonically inspired. I'm going to pray as they pray for you and know that when the deliverance happens, Jesus would deliver and they would be healed. But it's not always physical. Sometimes there's a demonic presence. That's going to happen as well. Number six, this is really good. Through reading and speaking God's word. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, this is how I walk through healing. It says, if you'll keep his words in front of you, you'll keep listening to his promises. That means you're going to have to write down the promises and put them on your mirror in your bathroom. You're going to have to put them all over your car. It says as you do that, they will bring life to your bones and healing to your flesh. In other words, the Bible literally is your medicine bottle. You have to take it. How do you take medicine? Three times daily with meals. What I would recommend is every time you have a physical meal, sit down and get a spiritual meal. Read the promises, say them. Three times daily with meals. I have a pastor who did this. He had gangrene. He was losing his legs. The flesh was being torn up. He literally threw a year of reading the Bible over and over again. He said it. His legs came totally cured. He's a preacher. He's going everywhere because he walked through the healing himself. Number seven. These are the last couple. This is so good. And this is going to be quick. Through agreement objects, sometimes it's a prayer cloth, sometimes it's other things. Number eight, through the fasting. Some of y'all might need to declare a fast. Isaiah 58, when you declare a fast, your healing will come swiftly. Fasting has all kinds of great implements on the body. I won't mention them here. Number nine, replacing bad habits with godly habits. Y'all need to listen to this. This is by eating God foods, exercising, and sleeping. Who would have thought? <laughs> Some of y'all need to stop eating fried foods. You need to stop having processed foods. What's processed? Processed means anything that's not in its original form. If you get a cube of cheese, that's cheese. But if it's a Dorito, that's not its original form. Anything that goes through a process is not a whole food. Don't eat those anymore. Okay, and the last one is this. This is it. Through agreement, through the spoken word. Every person's hands are lifted. The centurion came to Jesus. He says, you don't even have to come to my house. Just say the word from where you're standing. Psalm 107, verse 20. Here we go. This left section, you're going to come up first. I want you all to watch. Wait for every section to be done, and then we'll go to the next section. I send you the word. 
to be healed in Jesus' name for this section right here. Agree with me right now. Okay, left section, begin to walk right here. Just the people that need healing, walk through. Do not stop. Go all the way around to the end. This section right here, I send you the word. Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the blood of the Lamb. This section right here, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Let them keep walking in the name of Jesus by the blood of the Lamb. This section right here, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I send you the word that by his stripes you are healed. I send you the word that by his stripes you are healed. Be healed in Jesus' name. Now sit there and receive. Go ahead, keep them walking. Go a little bit faster, guys. Get them faster, get them going, get them going. Go ahead, we get some ushers to help with this process. We need to be moving a little bit faster. Awesome, awesome. Yes, yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, right up here. Go ahead on this side. Thank you. Just tap them, guys. Just tap them and let them go. Tap them and let them go. There you go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The moment of faith. The moment of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Now go back and praise God. Go back and praise God at your seat. As you go back, praise him for what he's done. The moment you received is the moment something happened. Right now, thank you, God. 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 Thank you, Lord. Yes, 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 yes. I'm going to do this as well. Everyone, I want you as well uh, on this side. I'm going to touch you. Thank you, ushers, for continuing. Great, great, great. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let him keep going right through. Right all the way around here, all the way back. Hands lifted high. Be thanking God right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let him come on through. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to also touch you right now. If I touch you, you can go back to your seats as well. God bless you. Go ahead and walk right around. Walk right around. I'm going to touch you as well. God bless. God bless. Yes. Yes. Keep on going. Keep on going. I'm going to touch all you over here. If I touch you, you can go back to your seats. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Yes. I believe right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right, walk right past them. Go right back to your seats. God bless you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just touching you in faith. I believe with you right now. I'm believing with you right now. Touching you in faith. Touching you in faith. Thank you, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God. Tina, come. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you guys so much. Keep on going this way, guys. Flow it right there. Awesome. Yes, yes, yes. Every person, hands lifted where you're at as well. Here's the deal. I'm going to pray for you congregationally right now. You are completely welcome. Continue to go. We're going to be playing some other music in just a moment. But I want to ask this question. Lift your hands up. I'm going to pray. If you right now say, I do not know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. As these people are getting prayer, this is a powerful moment. We're agreeing in faith. I want to ask you this question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Do you know that you're going to go to heaven? If you say, Gavin, I'm not sure. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I just want you to wave your hand at me right now. Is there anybody in here who does not know Jesus? I want to pray for you right where you're at. Anybody? Thank you. I see you. I see you. Yes, I see you. Yes, right here. Bless you. Bless you. Jesus' name. Okay, this is what we're going to say. Everybody together as a church, I want you to say this out loud. I want you to pray this prayer. Every person who wants to receive Jesus, say this. Dear Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I thank you for being my Lord. I repent of my sins. I believe you died on the cross and you rose from the dead and you did it for me. Now I believe that my life is changing forever. In Jesus' name, go with me. I will become a disciple. I will become a disciple. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Come on, give everybody a hand. They're continuing to walk through. This is what we're going to do. You can continue to come through the line. You can continue. You'll keep on coming. We're going to play some music. We'll keep the music playing. You are free to go, everyone else, out of this side or this side of the building as well. But they will continue to come in line. We'll make sure we stay here and lay hands on you guys as well. God bless you all. Thank you. The moment you pray is the moment you received. Let's have faith that God can work with.
Let's have faith that God can work with. Turn that music up. Turn it up. Turn this music up. Great. Coming in faith. Continue to come. We're going to be here to lay hands on you as we go.